everybody. We are at chapter 68 in Children of Blood and Bone. And so this is our last set of chapters we're reading through the end from this point. <coughs> so in your journals, make sure you're looking back and thinking about previous predictions you've made and really paying attention to how our characters have developed throughout the quest that they've been on. So we're in Amari's perspective. The fortress towers over Gombe's horizon like an iron palace, casting its shadow through the night. Troops man every corner, leaving no meter unprotected for more than a few moments. My heart beats in my throat as we wait for the guards patrolling the southern walls to pass. Thirty seconds is all we shall have. I pray to the gods above that thirty seconds is all we need. Thank you. Can you do this? I whisper to Femi, stepping away from the cover-grown kikiliba bushes, granting us cover. Since touching the sunstone, his hands do not remain still. Running over his fingers, his beard, his crooked nose. I'm ready, he nods. It's hard to explain, but I can feel it. All right, I turn my attention back to the patrol. Next time they pass, we go. The instant the guards round the corner, Femi and I dash across the manicured wild grass. Zane, Kenyon, and Imani follow fast behind, sticking to the shadows to avoid being spotted by those above. Though many diviners from the Toju agreed to help, only Kenyon and his team were willing to touch the scroll and awaken their magic. I hoped they would be enough to take the fortress down, but not even all five of them could fight. Connie turned out to be a healer, and if he wake awakened his powers as a tamer. Without magic that would strike quickly, it wasn't safe for them to enter. Thankfully, Kenyon turned out to be a burner, Femi a welder, Amani a cancer. Not that the Magi army I had hoped for, but with the Sunstone Surge, they could be the only soldiers we need. Fifteen seconds, I hiss, panting as we reach the southern wall. Femi places his hands against the cold iron, moving over the grooves and plates with the grace of an enlightened welder. He feels around for something I can't see, painfully slow as our time aches by. Ten seconds! Femi closes his eyes and presses harder into the metal wall. My chest clenches as time ticks away. Five seconds! Suddenly the air tightens. A green light glows in Femi's hand. The metal wall ripples open like water. We all rush through the emerging tear, sneaking into the fortress as quietly as we can. Hard footsteps pound outside just as Femi slips in. He manages to close up the wall moments before the next patrol marches past. Thank the skies. I let out a long, slow breath, savoring the small victory before the next battle commences. We're in. But now the hard part begins. Polished swords adorn the walls around us, reflecting our anxious faces. This must be the armory. If this fortress's structure mirrors the one in Lagos, we must be near the commander's quarters on the upper level. That means the prison cells have to be below. The door handle twists. I hold up a hand, signaling everyone to duck out of sight as the armory door groans open. I hear the sound of a guard approaching and catch his reflection in the glinting swords as he enters. I watch the guard, waiting, counting each step he takes. He's close. One more step and we can... Go! I hiss. Tizane and Kenyon strike, tackling the guard to the ground. As they shove a rag into his mouth, I run and close the door before any sound leaks out. By the time I return, the soldier's screams are muffled. I crouch down and release my blade, pressing the cold metal into his neck. Scream and I'll slit your throat. The venom in my words surprises me. I've only heard this poison in father's voice. But it does the trick. The soldier swallows hard as I rip the gag from his mouth. The magi prisoner, I bark. Where is she? The what? Dizane whips out his axe, holds it above the guard's head, daring him to feign ignorance again. The cell is at the base, down all the stairs, the farthest one on the right. Femi kicks the guard in the forehead, knocking him out cold. The guard hits the floor with a heavy thud as we run toward the door. Now what? Dizane asks me. We wait. For how long? I study the hourglass timepiece hanging around Kenyon's neck, reading the grains as they fall past the quarter mark. 
where's the second wave? They should have already hit. A blast thunders and booms, reverberating through the iron under our feet. We press against the wall as the fortress quakes, shielding our heads from the swords that rain from the walls. More blasts ring from outside, followed by the yells of running guards. I open the door a crack, watching soldiers fly by. They sprint toward a fight I pray they'll never find. The diviners, who weren't willing to awaken their powers, agreed to fight from afar. Using the bar's alcohol, we managed to make nearly 50 firebombs, building while others constructed the slingshots they would use to launch the explosives. With the distance, the diviners should be able to strike and flee on their riders before the guards get close. And while the guards are distracted, we'll make our escape. We wait till the thundering footsteps are silenced before fleeing the armory and heading down the stairwell in the center of the fortress. We sprint down flight after flight of stairs, descending the floors of the Iron Tower, just a few more levels until we can, see, until we can set Zeli free. We shall head straight for the Sacred Island. With two days left, we'll make it just in time for the ritual. But as we descend another stairwell, a group of soldiers blocks our path. When they raise their blades to strike, I have no choice but to scream, Attack! Kenyon strikes first sending a prickle of fear through my skin as his heat warms the air. A powerful red glow swirls around his fist. With a punch, a stream of flame erupts, knocking three guards into the wall. Femi lunges forward next, using his metal magic to liquefy the blades of the guards' swords. As they skid to a halt, Imani steps forward, our cancer, perhaps the most terrifying one of all. She leaks dark green energy from her hand, trapping the men in a malignant cloud. The moment it touches the guards, they crumble, skin yellowing as disease rages through them. Although more guards filter in, the Magi's powers flourish, unlocked with threatening strength. They run on raw instinct, fueled by the unbreakable swell of the Sunstone Surge. Let's go, I say. Tizane takes advantage of the hysteria, pressing against the walls to slip through the battle. I follow his head and join him on the other side, racing down another stairwell to rescue Zelly. With this power, no one can stop us. Not one soldier will stand in our way. We can defeat the army. We can even face... Father? The guards flank Father on all sides, shielding him from attack while he runs along the upper level. As he surveys the uproar, his dark brown eyes find mine, zeroing in like a hunter targeting his prey. He stumbles in shock, but only for an instant. As my involvement in the attack sinks in, father's rage breaks free. Amari! He gla his glare freezes my blood. But this time I have my sword. This time I'm not afraid to strike. Be brave, Amari. Binta's voice rings loud. The sight of her blood fills my head. I can avenge her now. I can cut father down. While the Magi take out the guards, my sword can free father of his head. Retribution for all his massacres. Every poor soul he's ever killed. Amari? Tizane pulls my attention, allowing father to disappear into an iron door at the end of this hallway. A door Femi could easily melt. What are you doing? I blink at Tizane and keep my mouth shut. There's no time to explain. One day, I shall fight father. Today, I must fight for Zelly. Okay, so we just finished chapter 68. A lot happened. So we've seen Amari really flourish as a character and take on this lion air persona that she gained when she was in the arena. So how are you seeing her take on this persona and how is she acting as a leader within here. Let's take a moment in your notes, pause the video, um, write anything that you need for your close reading journal, summarize the chapter, and then we're going to continue on with chapter 69 in Enan's perspective. I clutch Zelly to my chest as another blast rings. The fortress shakes. Black smoke fills the air. Screams echo against the iron walls. Cries break through the charred door. I run into a chamber and look out the barred windows. Though flames blast the walls of the fortress, no enemy appears. Instead, troops scream as they catch fire. Panthenaires run rabid in fear. 
It's chaos unmatched, bringing back all the horrors of Kwame's blaze. Magi attack again. My soldiers fall as they rain. No. I run away from the window and look out the iron door as a mangled scream rings from the floor above me. Fire and metal and disease wage war, ravaging an endless stream of soldiers. The men who charge are incinerated by a burner's flames. Those who shoot arrows are struck by a welder. The bearded magi reverses each arrowhead, sending the sharp metal straight through the shooter's armor. But worst of all is the freckled girl, a cancer, a harbinger of death. Dark green clouds of disease spew from her hands. With one breath, the soldier's body sees a slaughter. A slaughter, not a fight. Only three magi battle, yet the soldiers crumble beneath their power. It's worse than the destruction of the diviner camp. At least then the soldiers were the first to strike, but now their premature fear seems justified. Father was right. There's no denying it now. No matter what I desire, if magic returns, this is how my kingdom will burn. Enan, Zeli whimpers. Her warm blood leaks down my hands, the key to Arisha's future bleeding in my arms. The pool of duty weighs down my step, but I can't listen to it now. No matter what, Zelly must live. I can find a way to stop magic after she's safe. I race through the empty hallways, the battle rages. I ascend another stairwell, another blast rings. The fortress quakes, knocking me off the steps. I clutch Zelly as we fall. This time she can't muffle her screams. I brace us against a wall when another blast hits. At this rate, Zelly will bleed out before she escapes. Think. I close my eyes and press Zelly's head against my neck. The schematics of the fortress run through my mind. I search for a way out. Between the guards and the magi and the firebombs, there's no way we can escape. But we don't need to. They're coming for her. She doesn't need to get out. They need to get in. The cell. I rise. That has to be where they're headed. Zelly screams as we rush down the stairwell. Her cries join the agony of the night. We're close, I whisper, when we take the last corridor. Just hold on. They're coming. We'll get back to the cell, then Tizane will... Amari? I don't recognize my sister at first. The Amari I know hides from her sword. This woman looks ready to kill. Amari sprints down the hallway toward us with Tizane following close behind. When a guard charges her with his blade outstretched, she's quick to slice him in the thigh. Tizane follows up with a blow to the head that knocks the soldier out cold. Amari! I shout. She skids to a halt. When she spots Zelly in my arms, her jaw drops. She and Tizane rush to meet us. That's when they see all the blood. Amari's hand shoots to her mouth but her horror is nothing compared to Dizane's. A strangled noise escapes his lips, something between a whimper and a moan. He shrinks. It's strange to see someone his size appear so small. Zelly peels her head from her neck. Tizane? He drops his axe and races to her. As I hand Zelly over, I see that the gauze pressed to her back runs red. Zell? Tizane whispers. The loose bandages reveal the full extent of her wounds. I should have warned them. But nothing could prepare anyone for the bleeding maggot carved into Zelly's back. The sight shatters my heart. I can only imagine what it does to Tizane. He holds her. Too tight. But there's no time to criticize. Go, I urge them. Father's here. More guards will come. The longer you wait, the more impossible it'll be to escape. Come with us? The hope in Amari's voice cuts me. The thought of leaving Zelly makes my chest tight, but this isn't my fight. I can't be on their side. Zelly turns back to me. Fear floods her tear-stained eyes. I lay a hand on her forehead. Her skin scorches hot against my palm. I'll find you, I whisper. But your father... Another blast. The hall fills with smoke. Go, I shout as the fortress shakes. Get out while you still can. 
to Zane rushes off, carrying Zelly through the smoke-filled hysteria. Amari starts after him but hesitates. I won't leave you behind. Go, I press. Father doesn't know what I've done. If I stay behind, I can try to protect you from the inside. Amari nods and follows to Zane, accepting my lie with her sword raised. I collapse into the wall as I watch them disappear up the stairwells, crushing the desire to follow. Their battle is won. Their duty fulfilled. My fight to save Arisha has only begun. Okay, so we just finished chapter 69, and we basically saw the battle through a whole new perspective. So we saw the first half of the battle through Amari's perspective, um, through this ideal of saving Zelly, getting revenge back, and understanding that they are doing what's best for the goal they have to accomplish. Enan's perspective gives it's a whole new view. So what is his perspective? How does it differ from Amari's? And why is he still not being convinced to Zelly's purpose and to bringing magic back? Why is he still determined that magic has to be eradicated from here? So we're going to continue on from chapter 70 in Zelly's perspective. Escaping the fortress is a blur. A painting of madness and pain. Through it all, my back rips open. With each tear, the agony burns raw. My vision goes black, but I know we've escaped when the heat from the fortress opens into the cool night air. It whips against the gashes carved into my skin as Nayla carries us to safety. All these people. All these magi come to save me? What will they do when they learn the truth? That I'm broken. Useless. Through the blackness I try something. Anything to feel magic's rush. But no warmth runs through my veins. No surge erupts in my heart. All I feel is the searing slash of the soldier's knife. All I see are Saren's black eyes. I faint before my fears reach their full fruition, not knowing how much time has passed or where we've gone. When I wake from the haze, calloused hands wrap around my body and lift me from Nayla's saddle. To Zane. I'll never forget the despair carved into his face when he saw me. The only time I've seen that look was after the raid, when we discovered Mama's body in chains. After everything he's done, I can't give him a reason to make that face again. Hold on, Zal, Zane whispers. We're close. He lays me down on my stomach, exposing the horrors of my back. The wound draws a crowd of gasps. One boy begins to cry. Just try, a girl coaxes. I, I've only done cuts, some bruises, this. I spasm at the woman's touch, seizing up as the pain rips through my back. I can't. Damn it, Connie, Tizane cries. Do something before she bleeds out. It's all right, Amari soothes. Here, touch the stone. Once again, I flinch as the woman's hands press down, but this time they're warm. Heating me like tidal pools surrounding a Lauren, the warmth travels through my body, soothing the pain and aches. As it weaves under my skin, I get my first breath of relief. With it, my body jumps, snatching for the chance for sleep. The soft earth flattens beneath my feet, and I instantly know where I am. The reeds brush against my bare legs as the roar of rushing water falls nearby. On another day, the falls would beckon me closer. Today they sound wrong, sharp like my screams. Zelly? Enan comes into view, eyes wide with worry. He takes a step forward but stops. Like if he gets any closer, I'll shatter. I want to, to crack crumble into the dirt and cry, but more than anything, I don't want him to know how his father's broken me. Tears well in Enan's eyes, and he shifts his gaze to the ground. My toes curl into the soft earth as I follow his lead. I'm sorry, he apologizes. I don't think he'll ever stop. I know I should let you rest, but I had to see if you were okay. I finished for him, though I know why he doesn't speak the word. After everything that's happened, I don't know if I'm capable of feeling okay again. 
Did you find a healer? He asks. I shrug. Yes, I'm healed. Here in our dreamscape, the world's hatred isn't carved onto my back. I can pretend my magic still flows through my veins. I don't struggle to speak, to feel, to breathe. I... In that instant, I see a face that cuts like another scar in my back. Since the day I met Enan, I've seen so much in his amber eyes. Hatred, fear, remorse. I've seen everything. Everything. But never this. Never pity. No. Fury grips me. I won't let Saren take this too. I want the eyes that stared at me like I was the only girl on Arisha. The eyes that told me we would change the world, not the eyes that see I'm broken. That I'll never be whole again. Zell? He stops when I pull his face to mine. With his touch, I can push away the pain. With his kiss, I can be the girl from the festival. The girl who doesn't have maggot etched into her back. I pull away. Enan's eyes stay closed like they did after our first kiss, except this time he winces. It's as if our kiss causes him pain. Though our lips touch, the embrace isn't the same. He doesn't run his fingers through my hair, graze my lip with his thumb. His hands hang in the air, afraid to move, to feel. You can touch me, I whisper, fighting to keep my voice from cracking. The lines in his forehead crease. Zell, you don't want this. I pull his lips to mine again and he breathes in, muscles softening under my kiss. When we pull apart, I press my forehead to his nose. You don't know what I want. His eyes flutter open and this time there's a glimmer of the look I crave. I see the boy who wants to take me back to his tent, the gaze that lets me pretend we would be okay. His fingers brush against my lips and I close my eyes, testing his restraint. His knuckles graze my chin and Saren's grip jerks my chin back to his face with violent force. My whole body flinches, the calm in his eyes explode with rage as my breath withers in my throat. It takes everything in me not to cry out, to swallow my terror as his nails draw blood from my skin. You would do well to answer me, child. Zell? My nails dig into Enan's neck. I need the grip to stop my hands from shaking. I need to keep it from crying out. Zell, what's wrong? Concern creeps back into his voice like a spider crawling across the grass. The look I need is falling apart. Just like me. Zell? I kiss him with so much force it breaks through his hesitation. His contempt, his shame. Tears fall from my eyes as I press into his touch, desperate to feel the way we felt before. He pulls me close, fighting to be tender, yet holding me tight. It's like he knows that if he lets go, it's over. There's no denying what awaits us on the other side. A gasp catches in my throat as his hands clutch my back, grip the slope of my thighs. Each kiss takes me to a new place. Each stroke pulls me from the pain. His hands slide up my back and I wrap my legs around his waist, following his silent command. He lowers me onto a bed of reeds, laying me down with gentle ease. Zell, Enan breathes. We're moving fast, too fast, but we can't slow down. Because when the dream ends, it's over. Reality will hit, sharp and cruel and unforgiving. I'll never be able to look at Enan's face without seeing Saren's again. So we kiss and we clutch each other until it all goes away. Everything fades, every scar, every ache. In this instant, I only exist in his arms. I live in the peace of his embrace. Enan pulls away, pain and love swirling behind his amber eyes. Something else, something harder, maybe a goodbye. It's then I realize that I want this. After everything, I need this. Keep going, I whisper, making Enan's breath hitch. His eyes drink in my body, yet I can still feel his restraint. Are you sure? I pull his lips to mine, silencing him with a slow kiss. I want this, I nod. I need you. I close my eyes as he draws me close, letting his touch drown out the pain. 
even if it's only for a moment. Okay, so you just finished chapter 70, and Amar, or not Amari, Zeli has gone back into the dreamscape now with Enan, which we know is probably not the best decision, and she's not making what we could argue the best decision here. So why is she doing, why is she sort of making this horrible choice to be with Eden one more time and say goodbye? Is it love or what's gone on between these two characters here? So take a moment to summarize the chapter, go over it with your notes, and then continue on with chapter 71.